Yeah, my name is Lyle uh, S. Sanga. I'm uh, currently um, uh, head of the Rule of Law program uh, at the uh, Hague Institute uh, for Global Justice in the Netherlands. <clears throat> my involvement with the, um, with the ICTR goes back to its very inception. And um, I can tell you that um, for me to, to come in and, and uh, take part in the closing ceremonies is a very uh, personally uh, important, uh, significant thing for me. And the reason is that um, 21 years ago, uh, I happened to be visiting Geneva uh, at the end of August, and I had done my thesis on individual responsibility and in international law for serious human rights violations. And I um, was pressed into service by the High Commissioner for Human Rights because they were at, back in 1992 and 1993, 1994, there were very few people who had been writing in this area. And so I was asked to support the UN Securities Council's Commission of Experts on Rwanda, which was a precursor uh, for the establishment of the, uh, of the uh, ICTR. So, uh, you know, it was at the very uh, early stages. It was Boutros Boutros Ghali who established uh, this uh, UN Security Council's Commission of Experts on 1st of July, uh, 1994. Uh, just a few days after the, uh, the genocide was starting to tail off and uh, uh, Paul Kagame's uh, RPF were able to establish uh, effective control over the territory. And as soon as uh, the uh, UN could, it established this, uh, this commission. And uh, the three commissioners uh, were uh, drawn from Francophone West Africa. Their specialist ex expertise was not uh, mainly in international criminal law, uh, and they had other, you know, very uh, important qualifications. But uh, it was felt that uh, if I could join, leave my teaching in Canada and join urgently the uh, the commission to support its work, that uh, I could make a contribution there uh, with whatever expertise uh, that I had built up in my doctorate. And so um, I was I was thrilled to to do that and uh, happy to uh, take a break from my uh, teaching in Ottawa and Montreal. Uh, what I didn't realize was that uh, it, it, it was necessary actually to go and, and uh, take part in massacre site investigations. Um, my um, uh, colleagues at the UN said, well, if you're, going to, if you're going to prepare the reports for the Commission of Experts on, on Rwanda, uh, recommending you know, for, first of all, determining facts and responsibilities for what happened um, and uh, recommending what perhaps should be done about it, especially since the international community had uh, so abjectly failed to intervene during the course of the, of the uh, massacres, which uh, constituted a major genocide, as we all know. Um, so, you know, reckon with the situation and, and, you know, go down there with the Commission of Experts. So... Um, I, uh, in short order, undertook a mission with the uh, Security Council's Commission of Experts. And I have to tell you, what I saw was, was really shocking. Um, many people have, have seen maybe parts of, of what went on down there from their legal perspective and preparing cases and doing a certain amount of investigations. Um, perhaps fewer have, have been involved as I was in terms of uh, going from massacre site to massacre site in very uh, compressed time frame um, throughout the country uh, because our job was to get a fix on the situation for the international community at large so we could start figuring out what could be done at this stage. And uh, so we landed in, uh, in Kigali and, uh, and at the end of October. The Commission of Experts had already taken one uh, mission, and this was to be their second. And <clears throat> um, viewing the, the carnage up close, the immediate aftermath, it, was, it had only been a couple of weeks, or I should say a couple of months, since the, uh, many of these killings and slaughters and tortures and gang rapes had, had, had taken place, uh, was really a horrific experience. And, um, you know, I had steeled myself to, uh, to, to deal with what uh, I, I saw there. But you couldn't really um, prepare yourself uh, adequately for the kinds of things that, that, uh, that you would see. 
and um, so I, ca- I came very much close to f- uh, close, uh, you know, face to face, you know, close up um, with um, the kinds of massacres that, that that really really shocked the international community when when the extent and the um, systematic character and, and the degree to which these these things were planned and premeditated really became known. And I'm talking about uh, you know uh, mass uh, you know gang rapes of nuns, uh, torture of, of children, and you know slaughter of uh, uh, of, of uh, pregnant uh, women, and uh, just widespread uh, massacres everywhere that we estimated to be somewhere between a half a million and uh, a million. It's very difficult to know the precise numbers. It's all rather an estimate. But judging from uh, the the massacre sites that that where we counted bodies and 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 could uh, count the, how many massacre sites there were and soil displacements, in some cases there were burials, but very few. It was so soon after the genocide that all the bodies were just there in the streets or mainly in churches, schools, hospitals, uh, places where um, the uh, Tutsis and, and moderate Hutus had uh, taken refuge. Uh, which was a deliberate strategy by the Hutu uh, extremist militia and then the government, presidential guard, uh, government forces, um, you know, through the Mil Colin radio to, to uh, say we're coming, you know, get the cockroaches and uh, in Yenzi they called them. And, and that scared people into places where earlier in history they had been relatively safe. And this time around, uh, it was, they fell into a trap. And so these people were all grouped together in groups of 200, 300, sometimes more, in all these places that, that uh, normally were, had been safe. And that accounts for the high numbers in such a short time. Because then what the militia did is they, uh, you know, first came in with a uh, rocket-propelled grenade, grenade uh, concussion blast, and, and that stunned people. And then they went in with low-tech uh, slaughter. Uh, with machete or, or club, so when we went there, we saw, um, you know, either machete or or uh, club uh, clubbings, and you could tell by the the skull damages and everything else, and 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 we went from site to site by helicopter and by road and uh, and, and and walked through those things, so uh, that left uh, quite a strong impression on me, I must say, and it it drove um, point uh, home the the point that. Um, you know, when, when violations are, are, are so severe, um, it, 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 the, these things were not completely um, unforeseeable. And they weren't completely unforeseeable because there had been warnings in the UN. Uh, Bakri and Jai, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Summary uh, and Arbitrary Executions, uh, reported to the then Commission on Human Rights at the, of the United Nations, this looks like a genocide already back in August 1993 when he's when he was talking about certain uh, violations going on, they said this pattern, the, the intention to wipe out a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in the terms of the Genocide Convention of 1948 raises the question uh, as to whether there is a genocide uh, either in the works or in, in course. And so um, that, that, that report was not heeded. And uh, as we know, the, the international community didn't intervene uh, and, and did precious little to, to stop any of the violations. So it was a very difficult task for, for us um, to say to uh, President Paul, Paul Kagame when we met him that uh, we're here to bring justice to Rwanda. And, um, you know, as I've recounted in, in some of my writings, uh, I'll never forget what he said. Is, and he said that, well, yeah, you could, you could uh, perhaps understand that uh, uh, we in Rwanda um, have learned uh, not to put too much trust in the UN, which, which was very uh, hard to hear because, uh, you know, I was uh, young and uh, it was my first UN assignment and uh, very proud to be part of something which is a very noble cause, justice. But at the same time, um, what kind of justice can you bring? Uh, you know, when, when people have been slaughtered, their families have been ruined, 
there's survivors that are going on, uh, uh, you know, going through uh, a living trauma. Uh, what kind of justice could you bring? Well, it's it's a hard question, and I, I'm sure I don't know really any definitive answer to it. But I suppose one of the things I would say is that, and, and I'm proud to be associated with the ICTR in terms of its, you know, recommending its establishment through the reports that, that I drafted for the Commission of Experts, is that if you don't have that, um, then you, you, you lose uh, the opportunity to, to at least make this statement. If you're not able to to prevent or to halt genocide, or for whatever reasons that was not done, then um, at least you can try to uh, establish the facts clearly so that people later on, you know, wouldn't say that this never happened. Now, people are saying that now. now there, are, are, there are Hutu extremists. Uh, I've been to some places and, to my you know, astonishment, found myself on, on panels where uh, the other panelists were pushing a... Uh, a pro Hutu agenda that uh, that totally denied the gen- uh, you know the genocide, and uh, but thankfully those people are fairly marginal, and they're marginal because the ICTR plays played uh, a, a very important role, which is to document very clearly, you know who was responsible, how was it carried out, and and the scale of the violations, so. Um, that gives me some comfort uh, because uh, I can tell you that when I was there, I uh, so soon after the violations were committed, and seeing some of the a few survivors hanging around looking for their loved ones, <clears throat> I wondered at the time: could there really, uh, you know, uh, could there be much justice? Can we can we round up all the perpetrators? There were thousands involved. The ICTR has prosecuted uh, around you know, less than 60. Um, uh, you know, I think we have 55 indictments. Um, so the numbers are, 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 are not there. But what's important for justice is it's very difficult to get every criminal, even at the domestic level. What's important is to send uh, a very clear signal that um, you, know, you may be held responsible if, if you are a force, a like government or whatever, that uh, is able to bend the judiciary and the prosecutor's office to your will so that you don't fear it, um, you still may be held responsible uh, under international law. And um, that's not a perfect answer because the, the lives uh, cannot be brought back, uh, the suffering cannot be undone, and um, <clears throat> justice Justice cannot, uh, by itself, heal all wounds, uh, but it it can do uh, something. It's part of a broader solution, uh, so that things are not ignored, so that victims are not uh, disrespected. To try to resurrect uh, the rule of law at the international level, um, at, at the domestic level as well, where it's uh, been severely assaulted by uh, extreme violence. So um, so it's a special, uh, significant uh, time for me, even though I never worked uh, directly with the ICTR itself. But I feel privileged to have uh, glimpsed uh, uh, a, a very ugly reality um, about the human condition and about uh, perhaps also the prospects uh, for justice and reconciliation. Uh, to the extent that that's possible. And um, I'm hopeful that by doing this, this kind of exercise that, that has been carried out, that there'll be less violence in the world and greater international peace and security, human rights and rule of law uh, throughout the world. To what degree do you think the ICTR was able to deliver justice for Rwanda? You know, you, by, by asking what degree... It invites to put a, some kind of a number or a, an evaluation, which I couldn't do, of course, but um, it it's, it's, depends on which level you're talking about. If you're talking about at the very level of the individual, um, I'm, I'm sure that, that it's important for individuals who have suffered directly or their families have suffered um, to know that 
they were they were victims. They're they're not just part of a, uh, you know, to have it authoritatively established that they were not part of an ethnic conflict or so-called tribal war warfare, which was the initial view during the time in uh, April, May, June, even in you know in the media, etc., and among political leaders. Well, this is a these are skirmishes. They'll die down. Um, to know that. Uh, you know, this was pre-planned, uh, premeditated, systematic, and, and that one side um, was mainly uh, at fault, and that was the Hutu extremist militia. It's not to say there were not violations on the other side, um, but but in our investigations, and that was part of my work in in late October, was to determine whether there were also violations from the Rwandan Patriotic Front, and there were some. But they were, they certainly didn't count as genocide because there was no intention to wipe out uh, an ethnic group, number one. And number two, these were, these were mainly in the uh, excesses of, of war and in, in the course of the insurgency of the RPF. So we just didn't find, uh, after rather exhaustive uh, um, investigations, anywhere near the same level of violations. So, um, one, one cannot equate uh, responsibilities. It's very important that people understand that, and it's very important for the victims uh, not to say, well, you know, there were violations on that side and there were violations on this side, and let's all be friends. Um, there, there, there is a, such a thing as, uh, as, as the principal perpetrators, and um, that's important. Whether that gives some, some comfort to, to, to victims... Uh, to know, to, to have that affirmed, uh, it, it's hard to say. It depends on the person. But I think more um, significantly in a sense, or let's say in a larger sense, is that for Rwandan society to uh, chart a path towards uh, you know, transition from this conflict, and I think uh, the government has done very well in its efforts, um, it, it's important to, to, to establish the truth through a justice mechanism. And um, the ICTR is, has played a very, very important role there. I, um, I, you know, people, people do know about the ICTR's work. They do know uh, who was held responsible and, and why, and, and that's important. So uh, part of, you know... Uh, Part of healing is, is, is to know what, to be able to identify these are the wrongs that were done to us and that they are recognized. Recognition is very important. And this is, a, this is a high level international recognition that's been very thoroughly, competently done. So I'm very pleased about that. I think it's a very noble and important contribution. Um, have there been faults or imperfections? I, I think certainly many. Um, and I, I won't. Uh, Go into them. I think others can comment on those. Um, it took some time for the tribunal to to get going and and to decide on its prosecutorial strategy and to select the right uh, subjects for prosecution um, and to streamline indictments, etc. Um, the, these kind of challenges are more procedural, but the uh, you know I, I'm very gratified that the recommendations that that we made. To the Security Council were were, were taken up uh, to establish the tribunal in the first place, and that it's acquitted itself uh, very well of its responsibilities uh, legally and and morally as well. And conducting trials uh, in line with uh, international human rights law, uh, fair trial standards, which is a fairly exacting, you know, level that uh, the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials uh, did not have to reckon with because international human rights law had not become so rich and, and, and the threshold was much lower in those days. So, you know, um, it doesn't answer your question in terms of what degree, but perhaps it gives you uh, um, my perspective on, on its value. You painted a truly horrific picture of the things that you must have witnessed. How does that affect just on a, on a personal and professional level, how does it affect your view of, of humanity and how does that feed into the work that you you do now? You know something? Um, it, 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 um, I, I feel very privileged because you see something that 
aside, you know, the victims have seen it, the survivors have seen it, but outside of, um, uh, you know, the people directly involved, either as perpetrator or as, or as victims, uh, few people get the chance to see what, what, what I saw. And um, I'm grateful for that opportunity to glimpse it, even though it was very painful, and it's still very painful. In fact, um, I'm taking the opportunity while I'm down in Arusha to revisit Rwanda after many years. Once, you know, it's been 21 years since I first went. Uh, simply to, to um, put into perspective uh, a little bit what I've seen. Because many people have told me over the years, you must go back to Rwanda, it is a different place. And I'd like to see that. Um, I will even go back to some of the places we visited that were massacre sites. Uh, for many years I didn't want to, I wasn't able really to talk much about it. And now I'm starting to reckon with it. And, and maybe it's uh, in, a, in a way uh, um, some kind of, not, I wouldn't say closure, you can never really close these things. Uh, but you can maybe place them into a, pers a larger perspective. And my images of Rwanda are quite horrific. Um, uh, but I've heard so many good things about Rwanda, and it gives me a lot of hope that you know, um, you know um, humanity is, is, is capable of, of the worst things, but it's also capable of, of, of a great, miraculous, you know, uh, demonstration of love and, and, and constructive, uh, you know, action and to, to help others and purely altruistic actions and, and to develop and to, and to reach for the stars. Um, it's it, it, it's um, it's something that, um, as I say, uh, I, I I I feel ready to to go back and 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 and, and um, give myself a bit more larger perspective than what I've had. I could say that over the years, I've always carried with me the images uh, that I that I uh, that have been imprinted in my in my subconsciousness. And I've tried to channel those in terms of fighting for the rule of law and human rights in whatever small way I could do that. And uh, traveled uh, many countries doing that. You know, worked in around 55 countries uh, on you know, human rights, humanitarian law, international criminal law. And I often, you know, uh, take some um, inspiration from, you know, what I saw was a glimpse in a fairly short time. I. Uh, I dropped in from Geneva and then I, uh, I, you know, stayed ten days and went away and then came back for more investigative missions in December and then didn't go back to Rwanda until 1998, just almost passing through. Um, I, what about the people that live there and who who were very afraid? What, all, all the ch all the children that I saw there, um, their parents uh, must have either been killed or they had run to the then Zaire, now DRC. So when we went, we, just, we saw mainly children in the streets and, and, and very few adults. It was very strange. Um, but what, what happens, how, how, are, how are they doing? It's a new generation. That gives me also hope that uh, for them, there's some distance. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, you know, time, time passes, uh, but there's also a risk, and that is that when, when people do such evil, um, you know, it does get passed down in some way. Uh, victims tell their, their families, of course, what they what they suffered, um, and perpetrators may also uh, propagate their own, uh, you know, very warped ideologies. And so, um, genocidal action, in one way, uh, as deep as it is, is is intergenerational in its impact, uh, as well as reaches beyond the borders of of, of the country itself. Um, but as I say, um, the um, <clears throat> and this is where international, you know, the international community comes in. If the international community can come in with its best practices, and with its shared experiences, and with its norms and standards, and and and, and share that with a uh, with a country and a people traumatized by by such uh, violations, uh, I think that's a very very good thing. Um, it's like a, uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a medicine or at least a salve that that helps, um, and um, so 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 that so so you one has to channel what they've seen and and use it uh, uh, and, and if, you know for the 
for whatever cause that you can. And in my in my situation, it's uh, for the rule of law, human rights, and fighting for for uh, these things that I that I believe in, and that many others believe in as well. And that's the maybe another good thing is that we are uh, fortunate that uh, you know human rights is a broad based uh, uh, campaign and movement, and you know. Uh, two steps forward, one step back, sometimes one step forward, two steps back. But, you know, um, there's there's a lot of people out there. And when you're building bridges, which is about what human rights is all about, uh, you, you, you need to do it in a team. And there are a lot of human rights teams there. That also gives me uh, a lot of hope and a lot of, uh, you know, courage for, 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 for humanity and at the same time, I'm, I, you know, I can't uh, ignore what's going on in Burundi, Syria, and all the other hotspots that are there, and uh, hope that, uh, you know, uh, we can take constructive action. Mm-hmm. And um, that raises all sorts of other questions. I'm, I'm sure we, we can't get into today, but it's uh, th- those worries are still there. We're not, we're not, uh, we're far away from any kind of uh, utopia or uh, ideal situation for sure. That's why the, the struggle is so important. Yeah, you used the word evil before in kind of an interesting way. And I was wondering how in your mind you framed the level of violence and aggression that, that, that you witnessed. Well, I think in some way um, perhaps we're all capable of uh, some kind of a deep, very deep schizophrenia. And in the sense of being able to carry on... If you look at some of the, you know, many of the perpetrators at the ICTR, or indeed uh, before the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals and from Yugoslavia and in another, you know, criminal tribunals, uh, courts, even at the domestic level, you see the image many times of of the completely ordinary person who's able to do horrible things. Uh, the, 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 that, and that's the scary thing is that these are human beings, uh, many quite honorable uh, otherwise, you know, educators, uh, sometimes church leaders, uh, government officials. Um, with family lives and their cares and worries, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, propagating or or taking you know, being subject to an ideology which which runs its course in in a very very destructive fashion. So I um, I I I, uh, I agree agree that you know this is all very much a part of humanity, and that's what that's why I say I've been glimpsed. Uh, I've been privileged to glimpse that that part of us that I think, um, you know, I wouldn't set myself or anyone as, uh, apart from that. I think uh, it's it's astounding and it's shocking what what we can be turned into and what, how how ideology and extremism, you know, could could uh, could take hold. And it's very important that that uh, we promote the right values, and and that uh, you know peace and, and 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 human rights are are very much internalized uh, in in all countries around the globe. So um, yeah, I don't I don't usually use the word evil simply because, and I'm glad you noticed it. It's it's simply because there's a risk that you that you uh, isolate and say these people are evil, and these people are. You know something else, but there, there is, there is, I think, something to the insight that uh, you know um, people can become uh, can become distorted and can carry out actions that uh, are, are, are terribly uh, horrific. And um, they're human, and you know they're capable of terrible things at the one moment and maybe great love at another time. You know. Uh, so... <laughs>